Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at one spin with Reich Brinkman, who's going to talk today about heterogeneous computing. Um, we've heard about heterogeneous computing for a long time, as, but as we start getting into the world of AI and machine learning, uh, lots of accelerators and machine and Moore's Law running out of steam, we're starting to see a lot of different architectures. There's a lot of components in there, and they're not all the same. What does that do from, from a verification standpoint? So there's actually um, two uh, verification questions that you basically need to address when working with heterogeneous platforms. One is to um, verify the platform itself. Usually people uh, are fond of these platforms because they can be reused in multiple uh, applications over a longer runtime. If you think of a 5G implementation, for example, you can upgrade or want to upgrade uh, your platform implementation um, while you're going. You don't want to change the platform, but you want to change the algorithms that it's implementing. The same is true for machine learning in the eye. You don't really want to fix the hardware so much that you're not flexible on the application that you can run on it. And therefore, heterogeneous computing has become a really important idea on, on solving these challenges. Now, the verification of the platform itself is, is a huge challenge because you have to uh, integrate a lot of different concepts in it. For example, you have usually some sort of programmable um, CPU type uh, system, you have programmable logic in addition, and you have accelerators like DSPs and GPUs on it so that you can actually map your application depending on, on the needs into different spaces. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. What are we looking at here? So this is a typical heterogeneous platform um, resembling the Xilinx Everest, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, seven nanometer designs that is right now in development and it's gonna, according to Xilinx, be uh, taped out uh, this year in 2018. It consists of some software programmable engine, um, the CPU type um, architecture, plus some programmable logic, in this case FPGA, um, and in the case of Everest, it's a specific form of uh, programmable logic that is um, targeted towards machine learning AI applications and 5G. Plus uh, the typical I.O. that you need to order the interface of that system with the outside world and some processing um, and acceleration elements. And so this is a simplistic view of what could be a very complicated uh, type of platform where you may have many of these throughout the whole uh, device, right? Exactly. So you can think of this as one of the instances that you have in, in such a system, but um, you can also think of um, the individual pieces of being very complex SOCs themselves. So that poses a few um, interesting challenges because you want to um, address uh, several different applications with this platform. You want to make your IP uh, blocks that you use here very much software configurable. And verifying, for example, these IP blocks is a challenge because uh, with simulation, in this case, you need to run simulation for all the different software applications and configurations that the IP supports. How does formal play in here? So in the particular uh, example that we just uh, discussed about uh, configurable IP, um, software programmable registers can be left free to some extent in formal verification. So you can cover with your verification a lot more ground with the same set of assertions, the same test bench, if you like. Um, another reason to apply formal is, uh, for example, on the interconnect. Uh, when you look at these platforms, they are huge um, devices with hundreds of thousands of instances. And if you consider verifying the connectivity between the different um, aspects or the different IP blocks, that's a huge challenge because even writing down these numbers of connections is, is a huge effort and um, writing tests for each individual one is just uh, not possible. Does it matter if this is on a planar chip versus a 2.5D or 3D or chiplets or anything else, or is it still the same problem? Um, no, it doesn't usually make a difference because if you consider this uh, verification question here, it's a logic verification question and um, you have to solve these problems in any case, uh, independent of what type of physical implication, implementation you pick. One of the new things that heterogeneous computing adds is the ability to move data or not move data, basically process it in place where it makes sense and move it to other places. But you're dealing with lots of different elements and lots of different data types. What does that do for the verification problem? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, we have to consider that um, you have multiple different um, RAMs and, and, and storage elements in these systems that are distributed. And um, in case of, for example, the FPGA, you have block RAMs and you want to, in case of machine learning, for example, map your um, 
coefficients to these um, block ramps and, and pass the data through in order to avoid too much uh, data movement that would impact your power and, and your performance. And um, this means that um, having such a complicated architecture um, you need to worry about a lot of um, different questions in verification that involve um, different configurations and, and different passes that you have to consider. So it's a very challenging problem to foresee all the different ways of, of how data can move and that's actually creating uh, one of the verification questions that we need to uh, solve here. You mentioned two types of verification. What's the second type? So the second type of verification happens when you actually map your algorithm to the platform. Um, when you, for example, uh, build a system that um, implements a 5G base station, then you may buy uh, Xilinx or Intel chips for implementing the programmable logic part, um, and you have some CPUs there. And the question is how you map your algorithm onto this platform. While you do that, you partition the algorithms into software and hardware pieces. You again may use soft IP that you want to use on your programmable platform, uh, FPGA type. And um, then you have to go through the whole verification process of um, functional verification in order to see um, whether you have done a good job. Two new elements have crept in here since we started looking at heterogeneous designs, one of which is security. The second one is functional safety. Uh, a lot of these chips are going into safety critical markets such as uh, automotive and uh, aerospace. They weren't used in these kinds of markets before, and particularly sometimes at the advanced nodes too, with lots of different chips in there. What do you have to think about when you're working with those markets? So in these markets, you have um, the drivers of uh, functional safety and um, security in addition to the functional aspects. And um, in, in this case, um, there's uh, two things. One is the of um, complying with standards like DU254, ISO 262 where um, they are already laying out some uh, criteria on the functional safety side, for example. Those standards are missing on the um, security side at the moment, but uh, people are starting to look into that. And uh, when you look at the verification, then um, the um, typical flow that you apply for functional verification on uh, verification planning, on executing that verification and coverage closure by some metrics, repeats um, in these uh, two domains as well. And this becomes much more complicated as you start adding in more features into a design, right? So the heterogeneous part makes this a lot harder than what it was in the past. Yes, that's actually um, a very good point because um, when you look at, for example, functional safety, you will start your um, verification analysis by doing an FMEDA by mapping out uh, the different types of faults that can have a negative effect onto your function onto your mission function and um, you will uh, make a plan on how do you cover that and that will uh, continue um, into the hardware and software side. So what you need to do is you need to have a holistic view on, on the whole um, application that you're developing and then you need to uh, find the right metrics in this case for functional safety it's fault propagation analysis and fault um, diagnostic coverage that um, allow you to measure how well you have done um, on the design and the verification of these type of, of uh, problems. So what you're doing to some extent here is mapping the integrity of the entire chip flow there, right, and the data flow. Yes, so you can think of this as um, uh, three vectors that you have to consider. You have the design flow itself, where you start from the design phase, and integration of the IP blocks and uh, implementation into some sort of uh, platform. And um, then you have the different layers of function uh, reliability, um, functional safety, and security on top, and then you have a third vector where you where you look into how do you cover that um, by uh, doing a proper planning of um, your verification, propagating these results back um, into the plan and ticking off the boxes that you do, and, and in the end doing a coverage closure and with some different means of, of metrics that you pull up from the implementation level. Are all the tools there, as we start moving into this new world with lots of different competing pieces, do the tools that, that have been around for a while that we've used to develop really complex SOCs, do they apply here and do they do enough or do we need to actually extend them or develop new tools? So generally um, they apply, however there is a lot of challenges that you, you cannot address with the current tools. Um, if you look at um, functional safety, the um, design size um, is increasing so drastically that um, performing fault simulation um, is becoming a big bottleneck. And in this case, um, a very thorough analysis of the system in terms of where do you actually need to apply uh, fault simulation and how much of the faults that you need to simulate are actually necessary um, is, is becoming a real big issue. And um, 
for that matter, um, there is a lot of technology that is developed currently in, in the industry in order to address these questions. How about coverage? That, that's always been one of the big problems in verification. Yes, so in, in case of functional coverage and uh, code coverage, there was always the question of how you can integrate the results from different uh, technologies, be it uh, simulation, emulation, and formal into a joint view. And as it happens in, in these kind of complex systems, there is not always uh, the one tool that can do everything and not the one technology that covers everything and also not one vendor that will cover everything. So what is necessary here is an interoperability between these different um, type of systems. And um, one idea to, to do that is to integrate the results from different um, views that you have into a single view such that you can actually make a judgment on um, how well you have done. That includes both the um, verification planning side and um, taking off uh, the features that you have verified with assertions or with tests um, and at the same time also populating a joint view on, on the coverage from um, the bottom up where you look at the structural coverage on code. Is there a new learning curve going on with this as well? Do the, if you understand how to do verification on an SOC, does it naturally apply into a heterogeneous computing environment? There's new things that you have to consider. There is, um, for example, the hardware software interface, uh, a lot of IP that you um, have on the software side, and um, the question of how the firmware interacts with the hardware. I think in this space there's still some learning curve to, to, be, to be gone through. And um, if you look at functional safety, for example, people use software safety mechanisms. There's a clear um, connection between how the faults propagate through the hardware and what you do with them in the software that you need to consider um, as a whole. And uh, you can't, in many cases, do these things in isolation. So there's always a, a, a view that you need in order to um, integrate all of these aspects. The hardware can change, but the application itself, the algorithm, the software can change as well. How does that affect things? So that's actually one of the reasons why these heterogeneous platforms are popular. Because you have a lot of flexibility in these platforms such that you can actually map different algorithms and different versions of your algorithms onto them. For example, if you implement a neural network and you decide that um, you want to have a different network architecture, then it's very hard to fit that onto a fabric that's very rigid and you need a um, very flexible way of, of mapping that onto something that is still implementing your algorithm in an efficient and a powerful, fast, uh, and low latency way. There's another angle that comes in here too, which is that in order to, to make these platforms work and, and more reliable, you have to keep all these engines working at all times. How do you even start verifying something like that if you're running at not a full workload? Then does that change how you're going to verify it? So what um, happens in, in this case is I can give you an example maybe from functional safety that you uh, collect your use um, data, you, you uh, make assumptions of use and, and put that into the verification itself. So you um, kind of document what are the different modes that you're considering and then you put that assumption into the verification flow such that you can leverage this information into making verification more efficient. What are you hearing from your customers? What are they looking for that they didn't have before? What are they dealing with that they weren't dealing with before? So one of the challenges is certainly the size of the chips. Um, there's the interconnect question that we just discussed already. Um, connectivity verification is coming to an end with the current formal technology. There needs to be something different. But also if you look at functional safety, it's uh, latent faults that become more prevalent um, and the logic that is there. So you need new technologies in order to address this if the chips are becoming even, even larger. Rick Brinkman, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much for the opportunity.